of mine and a friend of the universe, as I like to add to often with these kind of people that are real intellectuals as our guest is, his name is uh, Stuart Mason Dambrot. And he's a, uh, well, he's a futurist. He's an intellectual of a high order. And he's also a conciliarist uh, that is there. And we also want to just at the outset say we were both involved with a conference that we're going to want to talk some considerably about. And I might even show that really quickly. This is just the, the program. And it was called the Global Future 2045 International Congress. And it was in June of this year. There were intellectuals and cyberneticists from around the world talking about the future of humanity in a very large t tableau. And we're going to want to address this. But uh, welcome so much, Stuart. So good to see you. And welcome to MNN. Yeah, thanks very much, and it's uh, good to be back. We've done programs in the past, yes, and you are very taken with Mr. E.O. Wilson, and you have that, but you're also a future. Share a little of your background, born and raised sure. a little bit in education, yeah, and then well, let's wade into a discussion uh, very of the quickly. human condition. Yeah, yeah, very quickly. Yeah, I'm from New York City. Right. Uh, um, my background is uh, primarily in uh, physiological psychology, which is uh, an interdisciplinary uh, uh, amalgamation of neuroscience, uh, cognitive psychology, uh, epistemology, and, and some, some other disciplines, linguistics, complexity, yeah. um, some quantum physics. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. And so that, that's pretty much the background. Yeah. Um, I've spent a lot of time out of the country. You were in Japan for a while. Six right? years, yeah. Six, six years, years is a yeah. long time, yeah. It certainly seems so at times. Yeah, I would yeah. think so, yeah. yeah. That's a long yeah. time. Very different culture. Were you in great education there? Were you in business or something? No, no, I was, I was uh, the uh, correspondent for uh, Nature Biotechnology, uh, IEEE Spectrum, Chemical Week, Photonic Spectra. Oh, I, I see. wrote for, uh, I wrote about science and technology for, oh, right. you know, for uh, uh, International Herald Tribune, The Economist, uh, Asian Venture Capital Journal, Nature, Science, New Scientist, Scientific American. With all others. of those, were you freelancing or were you? Uh, uh, I on was the correspondent or? of record for the ones where I was a correspondent. I was uh, on the Mass The head. Economist? Uh, no, that was part of yeah, freelancing. Oh, yeah, I was the correspondent journey. for yeah. the first ones I listed. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, yeah. right. And you got to know that culture, and that would have been in a period. Yeah, okay. And you're, you, you're obviously very interested in things cybernetic and comprehensive. You have a comprehensive. Uh, look or a multidisciplinary look at yeah, things. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. Um, I've, in fact, I've just recently started a nonprofit, Critical Thought Media Inc., uh -huh. uh, which is uh, its purpose is uh, multivariate uh, interdisciplinary science communications. Mm -hmm. Huge, uh, huge subjects that talks into this conference too. I hope so. Yeah, looking I ahead, so, yeah. and you're also billed as a futurist. Yeah, so you try uh, to look out right. into the future. I know? have no choice. Yeah, I right. Always, I always have. It's it, you know, it's not like I plan to become a futurist. Yeah. I was I was always doing so. Yeah, it was inherent even when I was young. Yeah, yeah. the conciliantist uh, part is probably uh, that might take a bit of explanation. Yeah, only because it's a word that's not in common usage. It's based on consilience. Yeah, he in, in, Well, he didn't actually use it first, but he uh -huh. changed its meaning and is known for it. He had a book published in paper anyway in two thousand and eight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, consilience. Yeah. And it's, in a, in a nutshell, it's the uh, attempt to develop a unified theory of knowledge. Okay, well, that's pretty that, much. That's which a pretty is big a, field, a, yeah. a big, a big yeah. thing to do. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I guess if you wanted to say what I actually do within that space, mm -hmm. it's connecting dots. It's right. synthesizing uh, developments in different areas of research in both science as well as uh, soft science. And as well as sociocultural and other trends, uh -huh. and finding the connectivity between them that usually escapes first glance. Does it ring a bell to you, pattern recognition, as a way in which we can use our mental capacity? I would say pattern. I agree with Gary Kurzweil on this. Yeah, right. Now, this is something he addressed at the conference. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Right, uh, where uh, when it, he was talking about his his book, uh, How to Create a Mind, and it was uh -huh. about reverse engineering the brain. Uh -huh. And his approach, which I agree with, is that. Uh, pattern recognition is, uh, is we are pattern recognizers par excellence, right? I mean, we uh, not only recognize patterns, but mm -hmm. then we, uh, the way our brain evolved, we impute meaning, even yeah. when it not necessarily, might not necessarily be there. Uh -huh. uh, we see causation where there perhaps is only temporal correlation. Yeah. So this gives us a lot of uh, the power of our intellect, but it also gets us into trouble. Uh 
mm -hmm. because we create reasons and explanations because we must. Yeah, you know, we're driven to do so, but a lot of times they're completely wrong. A very good example is Ptolemaic cosmology. Right, you are. Right? Yeah, Be, yeah. Uh, because it had nothing to do with physical reality, but yeah. it was predictive. Right. So right. that happens a lot. It happens, in my view, with religion and other things as well. We create an explanation. Political because systems of and political ideologies, is, yeah. yeah. Uh, political is, some, is more intentional. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to, uh, but a, a, an ideological explanation for some part of reality. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we must believe in it to reduce cognitive dissonance because we cannot stand not knowing. And that's the basis of very hard, uh, hard one and also very, very meaningful senses by which people and individuals and institutions get a sense of identity. I, and I when agree you mess with, that. with their identity, you're messing right. with trouble. Yeah. And unfortunately, that identity can be not in anyone's best interest, including their own. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because, yeah, 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 right. Yeah, right. So, uh, and many times, uh, it, because belief, strong belief can feel like knowledge, even yeah, though right. it's not, yeah. uh, what happens is people then um, develop strong antagonisms, naturally. Uh, yeah. we, we have an in-group, out-group function because of the social species. Mm -hmm. So, they develop strong antagonisms to others, other groups who don't share that belief or, mm -hmm. or an oppositional belief. Right. And it's, it causes a great deal of trouble and gets in the way, I think, of certain forms of internal awareness and um, psychological evolution. I'll well, you, that. You, you mentioned Ptolemy, and then that is uh, closing quotes in a certain sense with uh, the first uh, real telescopes that could study the uh, orbit pathways of Jupiter and Copernicus and uh, Galileo and that, and it played hell upon human consciousness then. You think of the paintings of uh, Hieronymus Bosch. Hmm. I mean, the identity was really upset by being told by certain scientists that they even had to put in jail before them saying it, that we were not the center of the universe, which their right. epistemology and ontology insisted that we had to be the center yeah, of my everything. Point, my point exactly. Yeah, right, yeah. right. And we may be going through that now. And we're, another we've level, been going through it since we stepped out of the cave, or you, even you from believe within that. the cave. Okay, yeah. Absolutely, I do. Yeah. Uh -huh. What about, and then we could discuss these things all in evolutionary terms, too, yes, because we certainly could. this conference that we're well, talking about, oh, go with ahead. With a caveat, with a caveat. Go ahead, talk. Yeah. You know, and um, E.O. Wilson has had some controversy, as have others, around evolutionary psychology. Okay. Um, and it, the problem is, well, with this idea, is that psychology evolves in the way that morphology does, okay. uh, you know, the physiology. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that's not really valid, I, I believe, in, okay. in, my, in my view. Uh, psychology is our, is the name for the field of observing the behavior that we know originates in the brain, at least now we do. We didn't, right. that, yeah. um, but of course centuries ago that was not really 30 known. years ago we didn't know there were neurotransmitters. Well, I'm we talking about even... We didn't physiologically I, the structure of the brain. But know. literally, the yeah. reason we still say, you know, uh, you know, when you feel bad, my heart hurts, it doesn't really hurt, but it's a throwback to the ancient Greeks when they really thought that the seat of consciousness was in fact the heart, because yeah. if your heart stopped beating you would die. That's true. Right, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. So all of these beliefs, you know, are really kind of wacky sometimes. Uh, uh -huh, but it's yeah. our attempt to uh, to continue to know more and more about ourselves and the universe that we find ourselves in. Yeah, and there's also a lot of <clears throat> things happened in the 19th century with uh, Mr. Darwin, and you mm. know some of the things that were put, being put forth on that. So we're understanding how do we get to be here. And it seems to me I don't know when <clears throat> or how we can project back through time. I mean, archaic times before Homo sapiens species appeared, mm. that we were contained in one line of the hominoid evolutionary pattern up the hominoid ladder. I don't know, the best candidate seems to be what they call Homo habilis. I don't know if that makes sense to mm. you, that we it's were possible. emerging out of, we were contained within, and prior to that they were contained, as were we, in australopithecine like mm. kind of uh, hominoids that I, had I, evolved. I have a bit of I have a bit of a problem with Good. the, the idea of it being do. contained. Um, uh, okay. We were you know that, that that gives the idea that somehow our genomic differentiation was embedded in these earlier species. That's not really how it well, works, right? It wasn't uh, not really. 
Uh, I oh, mean, there, okay. there are mutations, yeah. and some of them are successful. We know about Darwinian evolution. Yeah. Uh, and, and then there's a bifurcation when two species either divulge uh, geographically and, or, process, or functionally. That process right? should be very well understood, it, it would seem to me, even yeah, on into be. the current context about the system by which we inter-accommodate Homo sapiens within the ecological order now. The what difference is, the is with Homo sapiens is that yeah. we are the first truly, uh, every <laughs> complex, Every species with a complex encephalization has, you know, has intention, has a kind of choice. They can, you know, once, all mammals have a neocortex, just m many of them, not most of them, not without the incredible complexity of ours. Yeah. We're the only ones with an abstract language. Yes, yeah. other species do make some tools mm -hmm. and certainly use natural objects as tools from time to time, mm -hmm. but nothing like this. No, no. Right? Yeah. So uh, the idea there is really that in our case, mm -hmm. in terms of evolution, we're making it, we're in the middle of a transition, and that's a lot of what was the focus of yeah. the conference right. in terms of transhumanism and a new a new strategy for evolution, which is the subtitle. Or yes, right. um, uh, is it too far yeah. to go that we are beginning the process by which there is a new species emerging out of? Let me make a point and um, see. You you can you can knock yeah. it down, but I, when I said contained, there was Homo habilis what 1.5 million years ago. There were no Homo sapiens. They were the carriers of what was going to be transformed and have an evolutionary change of speciation uh, to what was the first Homo sapiens. And I, then no, we the, may be yeah, coming to right. a point where we're coming to the end of the Homo sapien experience. No, not yet. To one where it's opening upon a process of speciation, not just a political change within the context we've inherited, right. but that we're coming into a new relationship in the cosmos. Well, here's the thing, that when we start talking about transform and contain and yeah. all of that, there's a, a presupposition that somehow, uh, almost, not quite, but almost as if Homo sapiens were inevitable because they were contained in these earlier genomes. Well, that, that is that, not really the case. No, it, no, if I may, it wasn't necessarily so. We could have just been in a dead end. 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever existed in 3.8 billion years of evolution have gone extinct, you notice. Of course. Only a small portion have well, gone through uh, the eye of the right. needle to a new way of being. Well, it's, well it's, and it's that's that, something but we also should you be, have to take into account the, you know, the successive mass extinctions. Which well, there are responsible six, for, I guess, right, five a great mass deal, a great deal of that. Yeah. Um, right, but the point about that, I'm, that I'm coming to about this con the, yes, you know, the conference... Yes, by all means, we do want to talk to it. It was a major conference. Uh, having yeah. to do with evolution mm. is that we, as far as we know, yeah. Uh, yeah. We're, you know, I'm not addressing the possibility of um, intelligent life on other planets or any of that. I'm not no, talking no, about no, that no, at all. No, yeah. What I am saying is that on this planet, we are the sole species that, uh, that has the ability to start now with genetic engineering, uh, right. synthetic biology, right. uh, what we're learning in neuroscience, some of the research I'll mention that was presented there. Instantiating uh, consciousness through uh, well, cyber processes uh, and such as um, they were talking about? There was some of that, but it's more the fact that now we are the first species to be able to intentionally self-direct our evolution. Okay. This is something different. Uh, then, uh, right. and now you're talking a compare. Let's see. I guess we're without any other species. Most of the best guesses in terms of the common knowledge about 200,000 years ago that we, our species appeared on this planet. Right. Well, what I'm getting at is, is, yeah. is uh, we have to comment on technology. What is technology? Yeah, yeah. It's technology. extended consciousness, perhaps, or is that um, too I wouldn't much? Quote, I wouldn't use the term mm. consciousness. That it's okay. a tough term. We all seem it to is. know it's we have it, yeah. but it, it's not really a thing. It's yeah. not an object. It's more, in my mind, an experience of our neocortex Actually, action. Actually, that might be right. part of the goal that we'll achieve if we make it through the eye of the needle to a new way of being that is the, quali is the quality of the time in which we were born into at this particular generation, which is amazing to have that as a potential before us. Possibly. The, pro the consciousness is, is a tough one. It's used yeah, it's a lot. it's a big one. It's that might be lot, part of the answer but, that but will it's, synergetically it's, it's, emerge. But it's somewhat deceptive in the sense that um, I know I feel conscious. Yeah. Uh, you know you feel conscious. We're mm -hmm. self-aware. You know, and all this other. Stuff. But consciousness, again, in my mind, seems to be more of an experience. Okay. Every organ that yeah. we have has yeah. a function. Yeah. When our heart beats, we feel it. Yeah. We can feel you know other organs as they do what they do. Yeah. Um, to me, a consciousness is our experience of the activity of what our neocortex does. Right. Ra yeah, rather yeah. than a thing itself. It's not an yeah. object. Oh, okay, right? yeah, yeah. Like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. the thing about intentional evolution is that 
by <clears throat> being able now to, for example, uh, Ventnor out in California yeah, yeah. Uh, designed uh, an artificial genome that expressed as an artificial artificial bacterium Very and a synthetic life yeah. just within oh, a matter of years. Okay, yeah. and the first in, in his first attempt, they they spliced together uh, existing genomes of mm. two other bacterial species and created a third. Uh -huh. But the second one was the real deal because it was a synthetic genome to begin with, uh -huh. and that expressed as a viable life form that had never existed before. Uh -huh. So we're we're at the beginning of being able to design, program, create, modify life itself, and therefore our physiognomy, our physiology, our, mm. our, the way our brain expresses itself. You know, so this is self-directed evolution. Okay. Uh, and yeah. that's different. That is, that is the milestone. Yeah. And a lot of that is captured in this conference when they are talking about, um, for example, Re Randall Kuhner. Oh. who was on Critical Thought TV. Oh, by the way, that's, that's the show that I have, Critical Thought TV. Yes, you do yeah, have yeah, a yeah. really good program, Critical Thought, and, um, yeah. And we'll, you can mention that later. And we'll put relevant. a link to that yeah, at the end of the program. And we will have a link to yeah. uh, a, a, an excerpt from Ben Gersel. We'll get to that Good, a, a okay, good, later. yeah, spell it out. We'll get yeah. to that a little later. Huh? Uh, but the Randall uh, uh, Kuna is focused pr uh, primarily on whole brain emulation and... Uh, uh, mind uploading, uh, substrate independence. So everything, mind, uh, it, it's basically fo the, the general area, and there are several presentations yeah, about along this that area, line, yeah, including is, robotics. Is, that, is yeah. it possible, uh, and w if so, when will it be possible, yeah. and how will it be possible, what mm -hmm. will it look like, mm -hmm. to take uh, the content, if you will, mm -hmm. of our neocortex, what yeah. constitutes our personality, our mm -hmm. memories, our thoughts, mm -hmm. all of that, and transfer it to another substrate. They're you know? using the word increasing, and we're going to hear is instantiate. Yeah, it could be instantiated is, into is an is avatar. A popular way of it could be instantiated it. into an avatar, which would be yeah. a projection of oneself that they could then model the brain. An in. avatar or uh, a, a computer or a clone or yeah. whatever it is. Right. You know, it, the idea is, again, to transfer, right. uh, upload one way or another. Uh, what it is that I am, yeah. you know, what defines me, what defines you, into mm -hmm. another uh, uh, infrastructure. R right. right. It's a very okay. complex area. No, it is, but there was a great deal to talk here. about. Yeah, there was a major theme, theme there. And that's yeah. Ray Kurzweil also. He's been talking about that. Um, yes, he, he has been talking about that, uh, although uh, some of the others there, Randall Kuna especially, for example, mm. this is why he was chosen to be the science director of the GF 2045 Initiative okay, by then, Dmitry Iskov, who put this whole thing together. Yeah, he's a young fellow, out of, uh, he, and he had a conference a couple of years ago in Moscow. And then this was a major conference at Alice Tully Hall on June 15th. Yeah. There was attended, audience was full of really very, very smart people and very smart people on the stage talking about the future of things, particularly mm. cybernetic and otherwise. Yeah. yeah, it was it was it was a pretty good, very uh, pretty, pretty good uh, event. Uh, so, so. Uh, so that's one part of this, uh, of what they talked about in, under the auspices of transhumanism. Mm -hmm. uh, then there were other discussions in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, Ray Kurzweil, as we mentioned earlier, and as we just mentioned, uh, was focused on reverse engineering the brain mm -hmm. right. based on the fact that uh, we uh, essentially are uh, perceptual machines, right? We perceive, uh, and uh, the way we perceive forms uh, I don't want to go into it too much now, it would take a while, but basically forms uh, clusters of neurons that are uh, kind of invariant and they perform a certain function and he's way, he, it's a layered building up of how to emulate and recreate a neural structure similar to our own. And we're being, well, the genome itself was a major achievement that we got and so forth. We got right. a, 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 it gave us a uh, template for the future and so forth. Back again to that pattern, I have a friend, Mark Stallman. I don't know, you, you're going to come to know him, I think. He's a really smart guy. Took AOL public when they went public, and his father was a cyberneticist and was in the room with Norbert Wiener in 1948 when they coined the term cyber, mm. I means steersman. And it was just coming almost flat the whole thing in terms of the what's now exponential was just coming practically flat. But he did recognize, he said, information overload permits pattern recognition. 
we're being inundated with information. Um, Every day comes over the transom I'm not, of breakthrough. I'm not and sure everything. if I, I, I would oh. agree with how that's stated as permits pattern recognition. Well, uh, we do pattern recognition whether or not there's an overload. You think so? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, yeah. One of okay. our, it's one of our strongest. I mean, that's what we do. We see patterns. We, we notice yeah. patterns where other species just go through their lives and don't abstract off of their perceptual field and create cognitive structures based on those perceptions. Yeah. We do this. I think he was referring to the, the coming. He could see the coming cybernation, or the thing that's going to come, that is coming now and going exponential in our time yeah, in terms uh, of the yeah, computing it, capability, uh, things like the genome sense. and so forth. And yeah. it helps make this a moment of singular, uh, singularity that's on the horizon that he talks about, Kurzweil and others. And it brings mm -hmm. it back again to the thing. I did a program once with Isaac Asimov. He made the contention, great science fiction uh, writer and so forth. And more than science fiction. Yeah, more than science fiction, but he also, the, the, the laws of robotics, you know, robot, robotics is now coming into the picture so strong. And he said, this is the defining generation. Now, Perhaps. there's been 20,000 generations or 10,000 generations, if you figure 20,000, you know, 20 years average over the long haul and something like that, to be born into the moment of qualitative, not quantitative, but a qualitative, on uh, evolutionary terms, generation, is something that's a little hard to get your mind around. Mm -hmm. If you're looking back through all of history and all of the uh, human experience, it's a little bit, uh, I don't know if arrogance the right term or chagrinning that we're at a time of a qualitative, evolutionarily uh, related mm -hmm. transformation in mm -hmm. our relationship to the cosmos, which he seemed mm -hmm. to be saying. Do you think that might be a possibility well, at the time? Well, I don't know. I, on, the one hand, on the one hand, it seems to be the case, certainly in terms of scientific discovery and technological innovation Moving and creation. Moving exponentially in every field. Yes. However, I will tell you that uh, as Ray Kurzweil pointed out, I mean, it's you know, it's kind of, they're not not everyone agrees with him, but there is uh, a, a scalloped effect that there are these r repetitive yeah. singularities, and I'm yeah. sure for uh. those people around the time of the Gutenberg yeah. Uh, yeah. press and yeah. all the rest of it, it mm. felt very much the way we feel now that yeah. we are now on the verge of a whole, and it was true, yeah, right. So be, you know, before the Industrial Revolution, right. now we're in post-industrial society. It'll always keep feeling this way if the singularity can the singularity phenomena continues to be recursive. Yeah, yeah. So. Yes, yeah. but within the context of evolution and genetics, uh, there's, I, I look more at Arthur C. Clarke's lawyers, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why in okay, a minute. Okay, yeah. But yeah. the point, uh, the genome, for example, well, some of the, th the things that are under, undergoing in uh, genetics, uh, when, when the structure was found, uh, discovered, you know, the, the double helix, yeah. it was still, uh, in trick. many ways, a kind of a mechanical model, yeah. right? It was a machine of sorts doing... It's not that, it's a living thing. And the complexity of what's going on in the genome is beyond anything that Watson and Crick imagined. Well, yeah. Right? I mean, there's not just g genes, yeah. uh, there's RNA, there's transfer RNA, right, there's right. transposons, there's codons, there's silencing RNA. Yeah. There, there, the, we can import and exchange genes, not, with other, not, with, not only with other members of our own species, right. but with other species as well. Right, and this we can genetically the engineer things also, too. And that is what's, now. that's yeah. what's different yeah. now. Yeah. The ability, uh, for example, James Martin, yeah, uh, who, did uh, he, he just passed? Yeah, he actually, unfortunately, it. yeah. Major yeah, it's, mind. It's horrible, yeah, he, uh, he passed he was away, a, he, he, he passed he away a, literally a week after the conference. I don't want to get into all no, of that. No, but an homage to a great mind. It, an unbelievable fellow. I met him, I spoke with him, At, and uh, yeah. his presentation was focused on basically, again, a, a, a very comprehensive yeah. Uh, survey uh -huh. of the destructive and trends and constructive possibilities that we face over the coming few decades. For example, on a huge the question indeed. Well, he addressed it admirably. The, the you know on the on the, on the dark side, mm. there's of course what we know about in terms of climate change, overpopulation. Um, but he also pointed out uh, things that most people don't put together, such as well, if we're extending our lives, uh -huh. that actually adds to the population problem. Yeah. Uh, then he would also talk, he coined a couple of terms such as a giga famine, where sometime giga. in the next few decades, by mid-century, uh, if things don't change, uh, giga famine is term for a billion people dying solely because of inadequate food production. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. as you know... Um, Back to Malthus because, because or not? Is it a continuation uh, well, of Malthus or, or Paul it, Ehrlich? It's a, or? It's, well, 
uh, we can get into Malthusian oh. perspectives in a moment. Or but even the point is more, bomb, at least his yeah. point mm. is is that uh, because of these intera the interaction of all these factors, as we know, climate change is not just global warming. Climate change is multi-tiered. Uh, what happens over the next you know 20, 30 years mm. is uh, a series of uh, areas where there's now arable land, farmland becoming deserts, there's a desertification. There's ocean pollution and fish depopulation. Areas, uh, 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 increasing numbers of areas of oxygen dead zones where nothing can live. Mm -hmm. You know, so all of these things interact yeah. to produce shortage, you know, a shortage of, of drinkable water, a shortage <coughs> of food production. You know, <coughs> so all of these things interact. And his main point was that the trends are all of the for all of these factors are approaching a tipping point after which they're irreversible mm -hmm. yeah that's the danger and, and but he also discussed the incipient technologies that could address this among them genetic engineering right. nanotechnology and right. robotics nanotechnology is just over the horizon there is yeah. really a beard no yeah. I mean, nanotechnology is here yeah well it is here and you, yeah. got, you got things a thousand times stronger than steel and weigh nothing yeah we're, yeah, we're talking about yeah. graphene building yeah. materials graphene is, is a remarkable i mean yeah. I, I mean graphene for, you know just to explain it is basically a one atom thick layer mm. um uh, of a material related to graphite mm. oh uh, really okay yeah i mean not exactly, but kind of. And, and the point is that it seems to be a universal material. It can serve as uh, an electronic component. It, mm. can be, uh, it can act as insulation. It can, uh, it can uh, emit photons. It can, it can, just, it can do um, amazing things. Right. So this seems to be the uh, ubiquitous material of the yeah. next generation of electronics and related yeah. technologies. And that, that, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's a term that would fit into uh, what my guy, I like you, understand, we know each other, uh, Fuller, I love Fuller, I think right. he's really been right on the money. He used the term ephemeralization and also he used the term of anticipatory design science through ephemeralization and being able to do more with less is the way out of the raping of the planet that is seen has been mm. seen to be necessary in order for there to be that's, some so-called progress that's possible but, but you I, can you know, have I think uh, I have to say that uh, you know I don't want to get into this in any great depth because I want to stay focused on this as okay, much good. as possible but yeah um, there is a huge socio political component of what's hap of what is happening on our planet right i mean basically um, in my view yeah. there's a segment of society that it owns or becomes to own resources yeah. that are then made scarce or artificially scarce sometimes and mm -hmm. then sold at a profit and all that. Yeah. And that fuels, that kind of capitalism does fuel a lot of innovation and growth. It but does, it also yeah. creates a, 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 an increasing imbalance uh, in the uh, quality of life for uh, you know any given a given population in terms of stratification, particularly those at the lower end of it. Uh, particularly, but but yeah. what we're seeing, and certainly at first it was really obvious in in, uh, in this country, and now it's going on in Europe as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where um, the wealth is being increasingly concentrated yes, at the right. top of the pyramid, Absolutely. to the detriment, absurd of proportions. Those, yeah, yeah, absurd proportions. Mm. But it's it's more than that. More and more, it, it's it's almost. Like the poor always have to pay. In other words, well, they uh, always have. They have always they have. Not? Always. It's so always I bring been, this up yeah. because of the assumption that we're in this uh, position to change that. Uh, but what has to change is uh, everything. Everything has to change. Everything. All everything of our institutions are out of date. It's not necessarily yeah. as, even though there are uh, developing and emerging uh, technologies that yeah. could produce a post-scarcity economy. Wait a minute, that's a as, huge thing. Well, just just very quickly, okay. you know, yeah. for example, the two main things in my view yeah. are um, uh, it's called polywell fusion. It's basically a very small scale yeah. fusion reactor that uh, tabletop fusion. There are a couple prototypes already of the not Obama. Not cold fusion, not ponds. Not, don't forget cold fusion. Yeah, I, not what I'm, I am not talking about cold okay, fusion. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, but this type of fusion was actually funded. It's also called Bussard because of one of the individuals who passed away recently, unfortunately, up in Canada developing mm -hmm. this. But the point is that uh, 
Fusion is, of course, an energy source that yeah. produces enough to run itself. That's what we've right? been promised ever since I can right. remember. Right, and they're the both technological. Fusion right. is going to be the answer. We'll have unlimited. Right. It's always it's been, been five years away. still five it's, years away It's been five always. years away for I don't know why years. they've not been able to get to well, that. Well, the I, technological problems are immense. Okay. The, the, don't get me wrong but about this. But it's been the for the last 50 years. But there's years. also a political component. Yeah. Because once fusion exists, mm -hmm. then there's no need for fossil fuels at all. And yeah, that's it. It's over. You know, we have an unlimited supply. Because well, that sea water, seawater is the source of the fuel. That's yeah, it. right. <laughs> yeah, and there's you know, a lot of it. The only the yeah. only negative part is that in the large reactors, the large tokamak and Ida reactors, yeah. neutrons are produced, uh -huh. and so there's a there's a lead shielding that tends to get brittle after neutron bombardment over a period of time. Okay. But relative to the dangers of fission. Mm. Yeah, no. yeah, can, yeah. You can't have a meltdown. Yeah, right. You know, it's, it's yeah. nothing of it's not, no. not similar at all. It's, it's basically well, the way the sun operates. One oh, of the things oh. you mentioned before about when you were talking about the fellows talking about climate yeah. uh, climate right. uh, change and that that's a major thing. There's still people who want to deny it and everything like that. Neanderthals and so. But uh, one of the uh, one of the conditions that you did not happen to mention is the increasing lethality of the weapon systems that has underwritten the pattern by which human society has evolved using the term realpolitik, whoever's got the weapon system that allows them to prevail over another culture can go and conquer and set up the basis of political legitimacy right, for their right. system. Mm -hmm. And those weapon systems have apparently, from the modeling, become since about 1970 species lethal in the actual right. that's destructive capability. That's the difference. That's a major pattern. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's the difference. We, uh, we've always been that way. Right? No, when, we haven't always when, been that way finish, until very finish. recently. We've always been that way, in but not in, it's the degree, that the nature no, and the degree. No, qualitative difference. Right. The point is, whoever had the bigger club, whoever had whatever, that's, what's helped, that's in our species. That's been the basis of right. political legitimacy but, but, claims. But the, That's right. But the right? difference is that's now the major that thing. the weapons are species lethal, as you put it. Newly so, only since about 1970. Yeah, that, that, that's a major That's problem. a major existential new reality, and you never hear it mentioned hardly at all. Um, well, it depends where, you know, and would there be a, could it there be in a yin yang kind of consideration of things uh, that that's a that's an existential reality that is there, and then on the other side is this idea that you threw off, trippingly off your tongue, trans scarcity, that that we may have transcended at an uh, at a level of capability, a technologically augmented capability to transcend material scarcity as an right. ontologic yeah. reality which has right. never existed in right. all history of human society. And like I said, that even though the and other... And that's the, the, never right. mentioned. That's ipso facto Well, absurd. it is mentioned, but it's, uh, Where? It, you know, it is discussed. I can send you some links. But the point Please is... Please do. That, yeah, but the point is that um, the, other, the other technology that... Uh, would be part of this, in my view, mm. uh, is what's happening in the area. I, I'm not talking about 3D printing. Let me just. Yeah, make that's that, coming know. up all the well, time. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. no, no, I mean, it, it, it's present. And uh -huh. there are 3D printers that can print now uh, musical instruments. Uh, they can Plastic print. Plastic guns. Uh, the, and now, even a, as we speak, uh, the, the one thing that's been missing is the ability for these 3D printers uh, to print. Uh, electronic components, okay. but that's changing now as well. Yeah, it's all so the moving point is, yeah. the point of this, though, this is just very early on. Also, yeah. modified modified inkjet printers now are using colloidal suspensions of uh, cells to print replacement body parts. Mm. You know, yeah. uh, valves, right. ears, right. Yeah. Uh, and even and we've even, we've even managed to print functional kidneys, but they're small. They're very yeah. miniature. Yeah, but yeah, you know, yeah. we're getting there. And we're getting right. to where we can retrieve lost memory. Yeah, well, I'll get to there, that. I mean, it's yeah. coming every right. day over the transom right. comes a revolution from every field. Yeah, it's field. really remarkable. Yeah, so it's the, like a quickening in a pregnancy. Right. So the 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 uh, extension, and yeah. this was first defined by Drexler about oh. 20 years ago, right? Okay. But just theoretically. Yeah. But nanofabrication. Yeah. We, and there 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 was a very very early prototype a few years ago that used hydrocarbons to to create by by atomic and molecular uh, shuffling. You know, yeah. uh, it's kind of an alchemy, right? Uh -huh. way, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. But alchemy um, made re re real. But made so, real. We yeah. also can ha actually have some real alchemy now in terms of yeah. you can bombard a uh, given element with particles and transform it into another. So all that stuff is happening. But the extension of the appear the emergence of nanofabrication uh, plus tabletop fusion means that that's it. 
Mm. You can, you know, a, ta a, three, a printer can print itself. You print things by, if I want to print something, all I need is a recipe, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, that the printer uses. A design. To, a design. Yeah. And once we're talking about nanofabrication, which uses uh, molecular and atomic components yeah. to print anything, it, mm. it's almost talking about a Star Trek replicator. Well, the pattern right? again is, back to the thing I want to assert, that we, we, the percentage, I, I mentioned to you before on camera about Cervantes saying there's only two classes in the world. This is getting a little political or social or historical right. and all these institutions we've inherited. He said only two classes. One, uh, there's haves and have-nots. Yeah, that, And it should pretty, be yeah. seriously put up right. on the table. What does it mean to be a well, half. I think it's pretty obvious and pretty You think it is obvious? It doesn't seem yeah. obvious to me. Yeah, because I, I think it's pretty obvious because it depends. Yeah, I mean, look, there are dimensions to it. it usually, and I'm it talking usually, about the whole of the human family. Yeah, I understand completely. Not just a few people who are benefiting so much as you brought up a little earlier, that well, it's all the that's wealth usually how is it's going used, to But that's usually how it's that's used. That's history. But no, history it's, it's, is not going to be no, able to serve now. adequately to but, what's needed. But it, it's happening now, and the trends are, in fact, for... Um, again, more and more wealth being concentrated among the haves and less and less. So it's usually used in that context. Wait a minute, you just said, what did you say again? More, much in uh, the, the wealth, wealth is, is being, being concentrated increasingly amongst the haves. Yeah. Right? I saw so. Sarah Flounders, and she's a, she's a, you know, she's a Ramsey Clark, right. and that, but she said mm -hmm. the concentration of the wealth in the United States of America is more in, uneven, all, all balanced at right. the top, all concentrated okay. at the top, than it was in 1789 France. Okay, in the well, horrors of the time uh, that preceded uh, the... Uh, but we do know this, and so... Well, you know, let's, we, let's do we know it adequately right. or yeah, bring I think, it up? I, I think people and do, do we care only about the people who are the winners? That's what's always been the case, the king in the castle, everybody else wallowing in the well, mud. This is and are we going to keep a society where there's going to be a few winners are going to get through well, you, or something? Uh, look, or look, are we going to have something that's look, inclusive Harold, of Harry, everybody and the economy? Well, when you say we, we are going to keep, uh, you're, 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 you're assuming that there's a level of control on the part of the quote-unquote have-nots to change the things that are imbalanced. And the argument can be made that, yes, through a vote. But we know now that uh, the laws that are passed and enacted or not passed are and not enacted... Are paid and paid for by the rich. Right. So, yeah. you know, it, it, it's Except kind of... Except in public access, maybe. Well, perhaps. Maybe. Uh, yeah, but that, maybe but, even more real yeah, than you think. So, yeah, so back, back to the earlier discussion. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, one of the things that was very prevalent that you just mentioned was the research presented by uh, Theodore Berger about an implantable VLSI chip that learns, it's, it's for um, memory loss, either through, uh, there are a number of things that can lead to it. But yeah, basically, right. it's a problem when the hipp hippocampus stops functioning. Oh. The hippocampus serves to transform short-term memories into long-term memories. Okay. It does this by taking the neural code, which, mm. which Berger calls uh, the space-time code or neural code okay. because it, it occurs and it's not space-time like in relativity right. it's, it occurs in space and time because yeah. the meaning of uh, the neural code is contained in the time in the timing of the spikes that travel down the axon uh, but okay okay so okay. the point okay. there is that what he what his lab well actually there were there were dozens and dozens and dozens I mean, of, of researchers worldwide involved in this project yeah. and still are but what this does, uh, and it is implantable, uh, and it's not, no human trials yet, but those okay. are expected now to take place sometime within the next five years. Mm -hmm. uh, it started with rats, mm -hmm. uh, then I think recently, relatively recently went on to, uh, I believe, rhesus monkeys, perhaps, in the lab. Mm -hmm. But the point is yeah. that this device monitors the neural code it watches, it observes the neural code of a functional hippocampus. Mm -hmm. As the neural code comes in and goes through a four-stage transformation in the hippocampus, and what's output is the code that's delivered to the areas where uh, long-term memory, where, no, where oh. long -term memory oh. yeah. is represented. And it had been lost and it can be regained? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. So um, after that occurs, yeah. after the neural code is able to be programmed into the VLSI device, uh -huh. Uh, then that device can replace the hippocampus. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. That's the point. It's yeah. the first functional yeah. implantable yeah. neural prosthesis. Uh, wow. And it's completely yeah. remarkable. This right. presentation yeah. got a standing ovation. Wow. I right. mean, it's real. Yeah. And more recently, one of the really 
I love this. One of the mm. really amazing things that uh, he mentioned during the talk, which wasn't in the paper because the yeah. paper was published in 2011, yeah. uh, was they, they basically train the rats to press different levers. And then they observe the, the coding that's going on, the neural coding, mm. and then emulate it by programming the VLSI. And okay. So what they were able to do was take that programming and put it in the VLSI chip of a second animal, lab animal, a rat, oh, a lab wow. rat. Instantiated. Uh, in a way. Yeah. And then that second animal had the memory that was formed in the first oh, animal. That's a, that's it's really, wild, right? That's yeah. really wild it was stuff. Uh, it's it. unbelievable. Listen, yeah, one of the too. problems in this universe, I don't know any other parallel universes that string theory may well, exist me, out well, there. Well, i, I got to say this right now. String theory to me is a mathematical poem. Even Brian Greene, when asked if he believed in it, he said, no, uh, you know, it's it's... It, he doesn't believe in it. It's not a matter of belief. It's yeah. you know, and those multiple dimensions are a consequence of the particular way that string theory seems to consolidate the continuous manifold mathematics of general relativity with the discrete mathematics of quantum mechanics. Well, all there right, are many yeah. other ways that do that that don't necessarily. Well, the way I see it, you got, you got, multiple ten, dimensions. You got ten dimensions, and you they, got uh, strings, and you got the possibility yeah. of multiple. No, you got the right. possibility of parallel universes. The right, wormhole, you have all that. All that, right? You have all and that. And they're reporting that on but the we, science channel where now. Where they may be, but mm. we don't know that. Those are. Well, those are synergies. Well, no. What they Those are, are is uh, they're possibly mathematical artifacts yeah. of string theory. We yeah. have no, we don't have the technology. I only to, meant string theory as a throwaway line. I'm just I saying, just but I always any, correct. This no, out, but I okay, okay. Because people okay. think that we know that there are all these dimensions. No, we don't know that. We but don't. It, no, but the universe and everything is synergetic. It's all behavior of systems that are uh, as unpredicted in the terms of the, the right. temporal evolution of events in this universe. And I just made a little joke. Well, I, know, I mean, but, lighten but, up a little bit. No, a little joke. Not, it's theory. my mission. The, oh, it's okay. my mission to, to make sure that this thing the fire, stays huh? clear. That no, the, the things what, stay, what, stay I, clear. what the point I was trying to make, this being a one-hour television program, that one of the tyrannies is there's this tyranny of time. And we've got a clip we want to try and show, right? Yes, we definitely now, do. And so if uh, we could go on talking 25 hours, easy. We're going to do right, it over beer. Right, let's, let's do this now. Let me introduce yeah. it and then we'll yeah, go Yeah, okay. Um, this is a clip and maybe from, in the booth right, they right. could get ready. We have a clip with and you yeah, introduce This is a clip with uh, Ben Goetzel, yeah. uh, one of the world's leading AGI researchers, artificial general intelligence, which is the development or laying the foundations for the emergence of intelligence artificial intelligence that's analogous to our own. Okay. Right, not yeah. the simple artificial intelligence of expert systems. Yeah. You know, perhaps Watson wow. is an early indication of, he of something win, like that. He did win, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but uh, still, it's And not, he bit the chess, chess champion. But Watson can't do what we're doing. You know what I mean? So this is early on in the process. So this is one of the primary things. I don't want to sell Watson things. short. I mean, you know, we'll go no, ahead. Watson yeah. is, is fantastic. And yeah. especially now That's in the That's the machine that beat the it, Jeopardy that beat people. In Je yeah. One in Jeopardy. But mm -hmm. now Watson is being applied to medical diagnosis. Yeah. And that's where yeah. the real value so comes in. The medicine, the, right. the, the practices of medicine is all going to be going away from the medical people. No, uh, well. Uh, you know, it's all mm, going to be put into a uh, all maybe rhythmic thing. Down, in maybe there. Uh, you know, and a lot of people are going to be future. displaced in what they've been able to do in order Maybe to gain a, possible a living. Future, but one of the things massive that, technologically but induced there's an element unemployment. Of human, in human cognition of creativity, but not just pattern. Okay. I'm doing it, not okay. just pattern recognition. Okay, 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 okay fair but, enough. But creativity, yeah. and there is artificial synthetic creativity being worked on by Jürgen. Schmidt Huber in uh, Switzerland, but we don't have time to get into that. We now. don't have enough time. That's the tyranny so, of the time. The we got a clip to get in. So, this is television, brother. You got to move so fast. So stop talking. Know? Okay, I will. So Ben, so Ben Gertzel was on my show, Critical Thought. Yeah. Dot TV. Okay. You can see it there. Mm. Uh, and this is a clip from one of the segments called "Imagining the Unimaginable," where he relates um, a. Um, an idea by a friend of his, John Smart, yeah. that addresses a possible solution, a very, very far future conjecture about why uh, uh, there is the uh, Fermi paradox, which was when Enrico Fermi um, yeah. in 1950 was speaking with John Wheel and some other fellow physicists, they were talking about alien intelligence, and, and he said all of a sudden, where are they? Where is everybody? Yeah. And since then, that is known as the Fermi Paradox. Okay, if they're so yeah. intelligent, they're advanced technology by 100,000 to 10 million years. Yeah, yeah. Why aren't they? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is Ben uh, speaking to that in terms of a very, very uh, profound 
far future conceptualization of a possible artificial general I intelligence future. I think if we're going to relate to a higher order so like that's, that, that's, it'll that's be what, a synergetic uh, residency of a liberated humanity yeah. that will later accommodate us to other systems that are out there. But let's well, go. Well, it, it might or it might not, but okay, let's just see that clip. Yeah, let's run that clip if you can. I'm sorry we're running out of time. We're going to run right out of time. But if you can speculations about post-singularity intelligence was put forward by my friend John Smart. He wrote a paper called the Transcension Hypothesis. And this is kind of an interesting hypothesis. You have to follow the reasoning. We can already see in the recent evolution of technology that computer chips are getting smaller and smaller. Technology is being miniaturized, right? And right. nanotechnology is often seen as the ultimate extension of that. Actually, nanotech is for wimps. <laughs> Femto technology is going to be much more interesting. That's building things out of elementary particles. Take neutrons, protons, gluons, intermediate vector bosons, build stuff besides boring old atoms, build new forms of degenerate matter out of these particles. Why would you want to do that? Well, the same reason that we have miniaturized electronics so far. Special relativity, Einstein's theory of special relativity, says information can't go faster than the speed of light. So if you want to be really, really smart, you want to get smaller and smaller so your components can communicate more rapidly among each other. But what's the ultimate extension of that? First of all, it's femtotechnology, building stuff out of particles. Secondly, it's an increasing density of your computing elements. You want to pack more and more particles closer and closer together in larger and larger bulk to get a very dense, massive computing core that can communicate among itself incredibly fast. That's how you want to go if you want to make something maximally intelligent, which is probably what a post-singularity mind is going to want to do. But what happens when you get something really, really big and really dense? It becomes a black hole. Yes, it does. This is one possibility, a post-singularity intelligence makes itself such a powerful computer, it becomes a black hole, shuts itself off from the rest of us. That's a very interesting yes, a really potential interesting. solution yeah. to the Fermi paradox. Physicist Enrico Fermi's question, where are all the aliens out there? Why aren't they sending us radio messages? Well, the answer may be when an alien civilization reaches the level of technology that would enable it to send radio messages, Within a couple hundred years after that, it reaches a singularity. It compresses itself and becomes a black hole. Goodbye. On the other <laughs> hand, there's the possibility that different black holes may be connected by quantum wormholes. Or Einstein uh, Rosen bridges. I think. Exactly. You may have various kinds of tunneling between black holes. In that, in that case, what we could have in the universe is a bunch of black holes containing superhuman intelligences from species that have passed their singularities, connecting by quantum tunneling, Einstein yeah, it, messaging. It would be quantum tunneling, you know, which, which you know, since entanglement and quantum tunneling are features of the quantum realm. Sure. And these um, black hole AGIs would be also quasi-particles. Well, it's, qu it's, quantum it's quantum gravity tunneling. Yes. yes it, it's wormholes right. through space-time. There's also quantum theory involved. It's an interesting speculation. It's, it's, it's what, what it would mean is that there's this other aspect to the universe of compressed superintelligences living inside black holes, communicating through some kind of gravitational slash quantum wormhole thingies. And then all of us idiots who haven't reached the singularity yet are out here in the rest of the universe. And, there, and uh, we can presume that even uh, a couple of months ago, there were th three separate research papers showing uh, how it's possible using um, reversible uh, algorithms to extend the, um, the life of coherence, so that uh, the, uh, the ability to avoid uh, entanglement death. I would that's now. That's right now. If you're talking about femtotech, if you're talking about advanced AGIs that have figured out how to dispense with atoms and assemble elementary particles into new, new kinds of intelligent quark gluon plasma or whatnot, I would imagine that quantum coherence could be maintained over large, massive, so, yeah. complex objects in so. that kind of scenario potentially even having the same degenerate matter 
tunneling through curved space-time, maintaining its quantum resonance between different black holes. This is all complete wild-ass speculation. But, but it makes sense to me. I mean, it's but, Stargate AGI-1, right? Yeah, what it indicates is that there could be a lot of things beyond Terminator robots stomping around on the Earth, or any kind of anthropomorphic AGI that we're thinking of. Now, we have to bear in mind that physics has revised its fundamental theory of the universe every 50 or 100 years or so. Right. So it, it, it may well be that by the time we get to the singularity, we won't have these same ideas about black holes and, and tunnels through curved space-time and so forth mm. anyway. It may be something even <laughs> far wilder and stranger that we can't even imagine. But I do think it's important not to constrain ourselves to an anthropomorphic view of post-singularity AGI. That's really interesting. He's that's really an interesting right? fellow. Yeah, that's right. really He's interesting. Very, I don't know. I've heard. Right. I, I have to rely on people like Kaku and so forth and things. Right. But I think a black hole, a uh, wormhole, could be there's white holes. We don't well, have any yeah. in our universe, but they yeah, could I mean, be connections yeah, but, yeah. to a multiple right. universe. Ac across, through, by way, and by the, way and of and an, the big I, bang by, by might have been. Einstein might have been. Bridge. He, he yeah. uses the thing. But one thing I want to say about this, I want to follow up on this. It's important. We got about five minutes left. Okay. The important thing about this is his conclusion, not just the how cool it was, but the conclusion. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to get to about all of this. Okay. That it's essential to be able to let go of what we know in order to envision a, a possible future, well, okay. in a sense. Let me explain. Yeah. Uh, and the, the clues are everywhere. Yeah. Einstein, one of his most famous quips, yeah. imagination, it's part of a longer quote, but yeah. imagination is more important than knowledge. Okay. I've yeah. come to yeah. view yeah. knowledge as almost a dead thing. Once you know it, Mm -hmm. it, that what do you what do you do then? Well, you uh, have to have imagination to see where to go yeah, next, to right, envision yeah. where we might go next. Yeah. So uh, Arthur C. Clarke, The Three Laws of Prediction. John Lennon. Well, let me finish. Yeah. So Arthur C. Clarke uh, ha had three laws of prediction, and uh, well, laws in quotes. But one of them was mm. that I mean, no, some, no, some sure. are humorous. One that of them, goes without one saying. Of, yeah. One of them was that uh, if you ask uh, an an older scientist if something is possible, and he says probably he's likely to be correct. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Yeah. If he says it's impossible. He's almost certainly wrong. Uh -huh. uh, second yeah. one mm. is similar to that, not worth mentioning right now. The third one is my favorite. It's poetic. Yeah. It's any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, now that uh, okay. that is not that is very profound. Yeah, it's yeah. not trivial. Yeah. Because what that means is when we're sitting around at these these meetings and yeah. talking about futures and yeah. talking about the singularity, yeah. many uh, it, it's very hard to do that. Yeah. Right? It's much easier to talk about an extension of a trend, but then you're talking about decades. Uh, when you start trying to think about far future, 100, 1,000, yeah, yeah, 10,000, right, 100,000 right. years, yeah, right. yeah. the all long bet, now, yeah. yeah. All bets yeah. are really off. Yeah, yeah. And that requires ima imaginative robustness. Uh -huh. And that is something that I think we have to balance. We have more and more technical scientists. Yeah who are not envisioning and imagining they're working with what they have, and this is essential. But uh, in, in terms of uh, Thomas Kuhn's uh, yeah, thesis, paradigm. there are two types of scientists, the, the Einsteins, and then there are the working scientists. Yeah. And we need the Ben Gertzels and the Einsteins to give us these quantum jumps forward. Mm -hmm. Not quantum in terms of quantum mechanics, no, but discrete I understand. jumps yeah, yeah. that take us to another, another uh, starting point in the next rise to the next singularity. Including the tipping points that might get us to there. Uh, because hopefully, we keep, there, hopefully there, they These will. things build in time and everything like hopefully, that. Hopefully yeah, they will. Yeah, well, it's really, it's all really very interesting. This conference is to be lauded, and I want to let people know again, If you, let me show it again, if you can bring it up. There you go. This is the uh, brochure you can get by going, it, it's odd, you don't want to put www right, right. in front of you, put GF. To 2045 dot and com. this will uh, dot com gf2045 uh, dot com yeah and it's spell it's the numerics so gf and then the numbers 2045 dot com yeah and the program will be there there'll be some there'll be videos for many of the pretenders yeah. but they're introductory videos rather than the, the actual presentations 
But if you want to find out more about that, I'm yeah. actually doing a review of the conference. Good. Okay, good for you. That's going to be you. published uh, next week, okay. a two-part article on uh, Phys.org, phys.org, P-H-Y-S.org. Say, say it again slow. P-H-Y-S dot O-R-G. Uh, this yeah. is a science news service based in the Netherlands. Good. Uh -huh. uh, and if you go to my blog, criticalthought.com. That's easy. Criticalthought.com. Critical That's very week, easy. Yeah. I'll have, because of copyright reasons, yeah, right, I'll okay. have the first lead paragraph for each article, which will then, with a link to the Physorg site. Yeah. So yeah. you can get, and there will be videos there from the presentation. Very good. Very good. And, and, and I guess some presentation the, material as well. Yeah, it's a major thing. And it was a call. It was called by this young fellow. I mean, he put it together, Dmitry Itzkov, and he's something right. to be watched and everything like that. And this conference is something that's probably going to be remembered as a landmark one. There was one a couple of years ago in Moscow moving right. along these lines, but it's something that's really, really important. And then the question remains is, is this, uh, uh, the projection that we, you have institutions, you have architectural, you have thought, you have all kinds of institutional structures and things that people get their identities wrapped up in. And in order to try and, uh, what is the relationship of that? And as we said, these political inequities and economic inequities right. and the lack of a comprehensive vision by our political and economic leadership that is inclusive of everybody and the ecology right. and effectively able to make decisions that are affecting uh, the political and economic realities of the right. world right. is right. very That's disquieting. Yes, there it's, seems it's not more to be than disquieting. Vision. It's it's uh, it's outrageous. But in my but view. it is the reality. But it is the reality, and, and it's it a comes topic up in that the media we couldn't possibly address now. Yeah. So I just did want to tell the audience one last time okay, that please. Uh, this clip was taken from a larger segment, yeah. and there were three segments for Ben Gertzel, as well as uh, seven other individuals, including... And that Randall, was from where? From uh, where? Critical Thought. Dot TV. No, but where was where, where were you? That was on your that's, site. That's on my site. I, that's on your the, site. What's on the blog is criticalthought.com. Yeah. Okay. But criticalthought.tv is the footage. So for your all program, of the and that was part of your program and everything, and right. that was in a certain sense precursor or in a, in a line with this the, the things that were trying to be done with this conference. No. In many ways, I cover the same ways. materials. In many ways, same yeah. materials. You were the one who was But I also, have, I also have other individuals on. And Mark, Mark Wigley, for example, yeah. the, uh, the dean of the Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, yeah. was on. Uh, uh. You know, so there's Randall, so Kuna, Randall Kuna. From I the wish we could get on. you over here as faculty at MNN. I think you ought to not give a, a short shrift at all to the idea of uh, public access, which has a way of reaching out to... Uh, the masses of the people, a lot of people whose voices are never heard, but also has room for voices mm. of the very cutting edge in a non-censored uh, kind of way that seems not to be the want of uh, the established media, which seems to be going along with this very unhealthy trend of everything being concentrated in the leadership class, like has always been the claim right. backed up with guns and with the power to right. enforce it, that. a political legitimacy, which is a major problem. There is that. If we're to avoid that. a stopping conscious evolution in this universe with the power we have, rather than liberating the whole of the thing, which is the promise of the time well, in which we you know, live. We have to consider that they have their own vested interests. And you know, when it comes yeah, to- Yeah, and in the uh, end, so the on. biggest problem is not yeah. only to get a pattern of liberating, we have an ability, what does it mean to be a half? Let's make everybody a have. Let's do it within an ecological context. Well, and we, let's do it in a way that can include those who are all wrapped up with the outdated right. institutions we've inherited out of history so everybody wins. Right. I That's mean, the if, real if you challenge. Want, if you, I mean, if you want to, you could go to Scandinavia, especially Norway, Sweden, and see what a society that approaches that is like. But, no, but on a right. world scale. On, on a, a world scale, scale with well, all the varieties. There's a lot of work and to do there, my yeah, There's a and, lot of work to do And there's a lot there, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, adhering to outdated institutions at a time. It's like the pregnancy, the end of a, the, the quickening in a pregnancy we're coming to, and we've been